My name is Rich Schmidt. We're here with Tony Catranos. It's June 9th, 2023. We're at the Nicholson Library at Linfield University in McMinnville. Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much for asking me. Uh, the first question we'd like to get things started with is why wine? Why wine? Because it's magic? Uh, no, I think really because it brings people together. It has the power to unite people like nothing else. Let's talk about your kind of life before wine. Tell us where, where you were born and raised and kind of uh, early life. Sure. Uh, I was born in Idaho, and my early life, first few years, was a lot moving until I was, um, how old was I, like 10. We moved every two years, thereabouts. So right after I was born, my dad was in the Navy, and I lived on Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. I remember nothing but the fact that there was a drive-in movie theater and once in a while there were chocolates available at the commissary and we could get chocolate to take to the drive-in movie theater. But, and there were big iguanas, that I remember. Uh, so Cuba, Florida, cross-country trip in a Chevy full-size van with flames painted down the sides <laughs> as my dad got out of the Navy to go from Florida to California. Um, stopping along the way in a lot of different cool places because my parents are explorers. So I get my curiosity and my love of travel and adventure through them. And ended up in, in California for a while, in Eureka and in the Bay Area. And maybe my, my first brushes of wine was there, my parents being curious people, wanted to go see wineries in, up in the valleys, and we explored wineries, and they tasted wine, and I remember being very bored. And wine was a part of their life at home. They would drink wine on special occasions. Um, so it was around, and I had tasted it and liked some things and didn't like others. And then we moved back to Idaho, where, where my parents are both from, and that's where I was for middle school and high school. I knew it was not for me, so <laughs> I was eager to find someplace new and fell in love with Linfield on a tour and came here to go to school. And from here, uh, I studied abroad in France, and that's where the wine bug really bit me. So we'll pick that up in a second, but I'm curious, since, since, since the Linfield connection as well, of course, talk a little bit about Linfield. What was the initial love? What was the initial draw that brought you here? Well, there were the practical things and then the heart mm -hmm. things. The practical things were that I wanted to study journalism, and there was a program I felt that I could be a part of. Being a small school, I could be a part of the Linfield Review from early on versus if I went someplace like U of O, I would have had to wait. And they're like, yeah, freshmen can't write for the paper. So I'm like, I want to get in there, do this now. And Linfield had a study abroad program. And studying in Paris was a dream, or going to Paris was a dream. So studying in Paris seemed like the pragmatic way to get there. So I love that I could go combine those things. Uh, and then meet. I met Dr. Brenda Marshall and found out I could be a part of the debate team Again, small school, that ability to participate my freshman year. And so then the hard part was walking around campus. People kept smiling and saying hello to me. I kept asking, it's like, who do I look like? Everyone's so friendly here. They must think I'm somebody else. <laughs> and when my admissions counselor who was guiding me said, no, no, that's just sort of who we are, my heart said this was the place for me. So it just had all of those things come together that I was really interested in. So tell us about your experience here. You mentioned you wanted to get into journalism. Tell me about kind of favorite classes or, or memory, memories along that line. Oh my gosh. Um, so many favorite classes. Of course, I was in the communications program, so lots of time in William Lingle's. Actually, I think his um, media law class was my favorite class. And Elliot Tanofsky, it was women in politics, and there were just three of us. So that was that kind of special experience. What about outside the classroom? What were some of the other, other kind of favorite Linfield memories? Uh, gosh. Well, um, the Linfield Review, being 
managing editor, news editor, copy editor. I spent all of my Thursday nights in Cook Hall, all night, every night, every week, every Thursday, every Thursday night, um, working with that. But we were such a great, tight-knit group. I'm still friends with one of my co-editors. And getting to work with those people. Um, I only did debate my freshman year, study abroad in Paris, of course. And then just, you know, the friends and the things you do. All of our students probably really relate to that. So you mentioned France as kind of a dream and, Paris, and studying abroad in Paris as a way to get there. So t tell us about that experience for you. Oh, it was amazing. So I had been all around the US. I guess I had lived in Canada, or lived in Cuba, not Canada. Uh, but I hadn't really traveled outside the US. So the opportunity to go to something so exotic, so foreign, so distant, um, and so talked about was really amazing for me. I was so excited to go. And before I went, I didn't know I liked history. In fact, I thought I hated history before I studied abroad. And I came back just like, oh my gosh, Roman ruins and things in the 1700s are really cool. And getting to see that. But it was more than that for me. I was an only child, probably a little overprotected, a little sheltered. And discovering that I could go out in the world and I could get myself from point A to point B on a series of trains or metros or walking and maps and meet people from all over just changed how I saw myself and changed what I thought about things. And then, of course, meeting people from all over the world just made me more curious and made me want to travel more. Probably a favorite experience was traveling. I started out with friends, but ended up traveling on alone because they had a different plan. And they were content to stay at the beach and go to dance clubs. I wanted to go see and do and experience and taste everything, because that's how I am. And I ended up traveling on alone and stayed in a youth hostel in Avignon. And that night, I ended up going to dinner with um, a guy from Germany, a woman who had just gotten out of her mandatory term service in the Israeli army, which blew my mind, like a woman in the Israeli army, oh my goodness, and she's about my age, right, we're all about the same age, a woman from Australia, a local guy, and we just had dinner and talked about politics and life and literature and food and wine and all those things, and that moment just like was not unlike anything else. And of course, wine was a part of it, but great food was a part of it. The atmosphere, the history that was around us. And I've never wanted to stop traveling and, and exploring. So you talked about wine becoming kind of part of the part of the equation for you there. Tell me about initial wine experiences in, in France that you remember and was there something that kind of excited you about the world of wine? Well, the first experience, I think, was on night two, um, when Ed, our leader, had us over to his house. And I remember very much as he starts pulling out bottles to teach us a little bit about French wine so we wouldn't embarrass ourselves out in public. Um, I remember he pulls out the one in a plastic bottle, and he's like, never buy this, never drink this, life is too short. <laughs> it's like, set it aside, he wouldn't even open it for us. And, you know, explaining a little bit about how the place where grapes are grown influenced the wine so much. And I remember like, oh my gosh, this bottle of Bordeaux. <gasps> I didn't know what that was, but it just seemed so amazing and magical that we could try it. And, you know, one of the wines just really stood out, like this is, I like this a lot, and writing that down so I could go find it again. And our group of Linfield students, um, we were always cooking together and getting together so somebody would buy something that interests them and taste. And I don't remember a lot more about all of the wines that we tried, but it was on the table a lot. And then I came back 
and realized, oh my gosh, that's funny. I guess I'm in wine country. <laughs> ah, it's interesting. It's around. So tell us about that, about uh, sort of coming towards the end of Linfield time and deciding what you wanted to do next. Well, when I was leaving, I was convinced that I was going to be a journalist. My goal was to maybe get in with the New York Times and maybe I could lead up their Paris Bureau someday. I was very interested in politics, wanted to be a political reporter. Um, and so I really thought that was going to be my path and wine was just maybe a fun part of it. The winter of my junior year, I met this guy in Portland <laughs> and he worked for a wine distributor, which seemed very fancy. Our first uh, meetup was maybe under a, a slight ruse on both of our parts that it was about me being able to find some French wine that he might have access to, but we fell in love <laughs> and we're still married. <laughs> But he introduced me to the wine fact that there was a whole business around wine, that it wasn't just made somewhere far away and exotic and sold in grocery stores, but rather there was a business of distribution and how that came to be. And so before I even graduated, I had been to a couple of fancy wine dinners where we had four course meals and had been into some of Oregon's really amazing wineries. And so my last summer before I graduated, I started working in a local tasting room. And actually the summer before that, I had worked at IPNC not even knowing what that was. Um, just as general help, you know, setting up chairs and clearing tables, but got to try some of the leftover wine that was pretty amazing. So those two things made wine just sort of a part of my everyday life, but I didn't think it would be my day-to-day -day job ever. I thought it was just kind of what I did for fun. And I left Linfield. I had actually two internships to pick from, one of which was to help with Northwest Palette Magazine with the wine writing, strangely enough. Um, but I turned that down and I went to work for a Willamette Week and was a hard news intern for them. Before I finished my semester, I had their first ever intern cover story, which was pretty cool. So tell me about that part of your life then. You mentioned you were kind of an interest in history, interest in politics, interest in, you know, going over for the New York Times or something like that. What was it like coming out of school or being still being in school and, and having that kind of that kind of ability or that kind of that kind of position? Um, it was very exciting for me. I imagine this world and I think what I like most about journalism was that I didn't have to stay with one thing all the time. That as a journalist, you constantly get to learn and explore something a little new each time. That you get, you have this premise to meet people and learn about what they do and what drives them. So I thought I would do that. I thought I would be exploring that every day and I love to write. So um, I imagined, I couldn't imagine life without writing every day in some way. So that would fulfill that niche. After I finished my time as an uh, intern at Willamette Week, they had just lost two reporters. So I had opportunity to freelance for a bit longer, but they wouldn't hire me. They wanted experience. Uh, but it was a time that journalism was changing uh, rapidly and newspapers were closing. Um, one of my good friends from the Linfield Review, Teresa Smith, she um, bought a small community paper and ran it for a while. And I watched her do that. I had other friends who were working for small papers and you know, working their hearts out, you know, long, long days, seven days a week, making almost nothing. But I got for a while where I couldn't find a job without you know, needed to make a serious move or change. And then I had the opportunity to do something that I still think is pretty special, which was I was the first person writing original news content for web-only publication, definitely west of the Mississippi. And we couldn't find anybody because it wasn't Google yet. 
doing it east of the Mississippi, but we assumed we weren't the only ones who had this crazy idea. <laughs> and so I had a desk in the Capitol uh, down in Salem in the press room. They thought we were crazy, so they wouldn't they wouldn't lease me the open office that was there, so I had to sit in the, the common space of the press corps and got to go report on what was happening in state news and politics. And we had this grand idea of making news access free and easy and open for everybody. That must have been a wild time. Yeah. I had the only digital camera in the entire press corps. It was pretty cool. One of the photographers from KGW um, worked with me and we figured out ways to pull stills until they found out I was doing it <laughs> from his cameras because he'd get better shots because I was always at the back of the press corps. But it was fun times. It was great stuff. I went through a whole election cycle of getting to interview the presidential candidates and see people coming through. Were there sort of standout moments or stand -out, stand out memories from that time? The craziness of how political systems work, mm -hmm. that the ins and outs that we don't see every day, I think that that's what stands out most. Mm -hmm. Of um, My colleagues were great and they would like, you know, hey, you know, we know you're new here. This is what's really going on with this. Or, hey, hey, you know, I, you know, I know there's a couple things going on tomorrow, but you should really be at this one because. And learning sort of why that was and which committee meetings I might want to poke my head into. With that kind of, you mentioned kind of a grand experiment or, you know, the, the f first to try this. So how did it work? How, how, how did the operation, was the operation successful? In the end, no, because we, we were a dot-com bust before anyone used those terms. Um, and the problem was that we thought the internet was such a pure and virgin media that we couldn't imagine advertising in this space. So we were waiting for software that would allow us to charge per click. Um, it wasn't available yet. So we were in this weird space of not really being able to charge for our content and producing content every day. We had meetings with the Oregonian and Willamette Week saying, hey, you need to put your news content online and having editors tell us we were crazy, that nobody was going to read that. But maybe they're personal someday, Willamette Week told us. They're personals. They were interested in how they could do that. Um, and it's just amazing to think how much things have changed. And we just kept saying, no, this is the future. This is the future. So what came next for you after that? Falling back on that wine job. <laughs> so I'd not given up working at Rex Hill in the tasting room. And when uh, Robin, my boss for, it was called Cascadia.com, when Cascadia went under and he said, you know, I just can't, I can't pay you anymore. And he did everything he could to help me out. Um, including giving me the stapler. I, I still have that stapler. <laughs> uh, but um, it happened to be fall. And so Lynn Panarash was our winemaker at Rexhill at the time. And I went to Lynn and I said, so Lynn, I'm only going to be sending out resumes for the next few months, probably uh, looking for something. So if you need help at all during Crush, just give me a call. Well, it was 1996, the harvest was way bigger than we anticipated for a few different reasons. And like a couple of days after that, she said, I can really use you. And I ended up working crush every single day for about seven weeks, something like that. So it was an amazing opportunity. She, she was such an amazing um, boss through that time because she made sure I got my hands into absolutely everything. I did everything, and I was the sugar fairy for the, <laughs> the harvest, so I was taking bricks on every fermenter every morning and getting her that information. I was the first one to check all of those, so getting to do that was amazing to see how things changed, and I learned so much during that procedure that getting to see what happened 
day after day after day and getting to see things go different directions. Then from there, you know, I kind of pieced it together for a while and finally the car payment was due and the insurance was due. And I had gone to do a tasting in a grocery store and the wine steward there said, hey, you're really good at this. We need somebody, here's an application, just take it home. And I was like, no, 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 I'm a writer. Wine's just for fun, yeah. I looked at the bills and I said, all right, I had to fill out this application. <laughs> Principles only last so long, right? Exactly, yeah, and goals and you know, the thought of moving someplace to Eastern Oregon for you know, $24,000 a year and knowing that I was gonna work you know, seven days a week trying to come up with community news stories. I was like, all right, well, <laughs> but I got into it and I just, I never stopped. So before we go move to that, I'm curious about, obviously wine had been a part of your life for a while now. What, did anything change about your perspective after having a crush experience, after having a harvest experience? Oh yeah, it, I had even more respect for wine. The fact that it was so physically demanding <laughs> to work. Um, I had no idea just how, what the physical demands would be to make it happen and how many of us were putting so much energy and effort into making it. I just had more respect for science at that point too. <laughs> really wish I had taken a, paid more attention in chemistry class. So then with the, with the new, the, the job you applied for, what, what was the position, what was the position and, and what was sort of your initial experience in it? So my first position was, so I'd been part-time in the tasting room, did the crush, uh, was as a wine steward at Zupan's when they had the big store in West Lynn. I went into grocery retail where I actually worked for about 20 years in, in all in terms of grocery and wine. What was it, what were your initial impressions? Oh, I was so overwhelmed. <laughs> I was so overwhelmed. Every step along the way, I would just realize how much more there was to learn. That I thought, yeah, I know a lot. Oh, I don't know very much. Um, I remember just trying to figure out all of the wines in that section because there were about, when I started, well, there were definitely more than a thousand wines on the shelf. And I had tasted a handful of them. But I met these amazing salespeople who knew their wine so well. And I was so amazed because they had stories. They had been to these places and they could tell me about the vineyards and the people. And I was so infatuated with these stories and so envious of their experiences to travel because of course, you know, I'm still paying my college loan. I'm still <laughs> trying to, you know, just keep afloat. And I was like, I want to get back to Europe. How do I get back there? How do I get to see more of Italy? How do I get to see these vineyards? And they just kept saying, stick with it. You'll get there. Stick with it. You'll get there. There was just this amazing group of people who sold wine, who knew all of these things and had been all these spaces and were incredibly generous with their knowledge and with their time and with their sample bottles. <laughs> it's good to be a buyer. Yeah. And so I learned it bottle by bottle. Yeah, I'm curious about that process for you. It obviously it is overwhelming. So how did, how, how did you sort of measure progress? Bottle by bottle. <laughs> I'll keep saying that. Yeah, so I, I really just, my beginning learning was just the single bottle. And I would learn about the grape, I would learn about the region. Distributor sales reps are so knowledgeable. Um, so they would share information, I would go to every trade tasting that I could get out of my store to get to. Uh, so I would go, I'd try, I'd get to meet the people. I felt lucky working in a store that did enough business and building those relationships that I got invited to those trade lunches where I got to meet winemakers and proprietors from all over the world and get to learn from them directly and taste their wines and taste things 
even not necessarily that I, I would even be able to sell, but I had a great clientele in Westland, so price was no object for many of my, my customers. And they quickly learned that if I was really passionate about something, they would probably like it too, because I didn't have to sell anything I didn't love most of the time. So it was exciting for me to help them make the same discoveries. And I think I liked that as much as discovering things on my own. What did you start to determine were the things that drew you to a wine? The place and the people. So I was and still am, I think, most excited about wines that have some tie to the place that they're grown, whether it's tradition and history or someone innovating with that space and trying to find what's new or what's next. And people who are passionate about what they're doing, it's easy to fall in love with that. So you talked about being in, in the retail world for a while. Tell me about how it changed. How, 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 did, how did sort of grocery wine retail change during that time? Biggest change is consolidation and um, the ownership changing. I mean, one big example is thinking about how our Fred Myers in this area used to be bought out of a Portland office with a Portland buyer that we would all see and who knew, and that the wine stewards in the stores had a lot of freedom for, to reflect their communities, their neighborhoods, their own personal taste. And now it's all being driven out of a central office. And we see the number of Oregon wines shrinking. We see things popping up on, based on you know, national Nielsen and on volume. But the truth is, is wine doesn't work that way. It's not Pepsi versus Coke. Uh, I mean, you think in so many other things like breakfast cereal, right? We all have different preferences. We may be whether it's you know, that more organic granola versus you know, Fruit Loops, two really different things, yes. But you don't necessarily change your tastes in those from summer to winter. Well, unless maybe swimsuit season's coming and maybe you go from sweet loops to the granola. Um, but wine is so finite. It's such a finite agricultural product. And what we enjoy can be so seasonal, like wanting more rosé in the summer and more full-bodied reds in the winter. There's not a lot of other products that work that way. And this whole very much category management metric driven sort of analysis of wine doesn't work that way. I mean, I could think of when I was a buyer and some of my best-selling wines, if I could have it 365 days a year, it might have been my number one seller, but Cameron non-vintage Pinot, I got four cases a year, period. <laughs> it would sell out in a week. <laughs> so that metric is never going to show up on the charts properly. So after that kind of introduction into to wine education as a, as, a, as, a, as a person being educated, tell me at what point in the process being an educator came into play? Well, I always loved teaching students, so I did classes for my consumers. Um, oh my gosh, just a few years in to starting in wine retail. And then when I moved to being a corporate buyer, we did classes in, in all of our stores to begin with. And I would, I would take those on. I wanted to do those. And whether it was just Wine Basics or teaming up with our cheese buyer at the time, Eric Rose, and doing you know, a wine and cheese where I was learning cheese from him or pairing up with one of my wine stewards who had lived in Spain and doing a Spanish food and wine pairing. That's where it started. And I really loved it. What did you find people, where, where, when they were coming to classes like that, where did you find their, their knowledge level tended to be? And what did you find sort of excited them about learning from you? Well, they were sort of all over the board. Sometimes I'd have students in the class who knew more about something than I did. It, it certainly, and that was my opportunity to learn. Maybe they had spent more time in, in Europe at a certain place. Um, to people who barely knew wine, and it would just be exciting for me to find that maybe Riesling or sweeter style that appeared, appealed to them. What excited them about learning from you? 
Oh, um, people tell me it's my enthusiasm <laughs> that they <laughs> connect with. <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. So at this point, did you, you mentioned obviously travel being a big draw for you. Did you start to travel more into wine country at this point? I did. So it's good to be the buyer. Uh, after I became a corporate buyer for New Seasons, buying for all the stores, opportunities started cropping up to go and see where the wines were made and grown. And so my, my first trip was in 2003, and I got to go with one of my favorite importers, um, Greg Zancanella, who has, was one of the reasons that Portland drinks so much amazing Italian wine. Greg and his colleague, Todd Bacon, these guys really helped set Portland's palate for amazing um, traditional Italian wines. So Greg uh, invited me to go along with him and his partner, Susie Brown, to go to um, Van Italy, which is an absolutely amazing opportunity. So I went to Van Italy with them, and then we traveled for another more than a week throughout Italy and then up into France. And it was so crazy for me to meet these people and go to the vineyards and taste and see how Greg did business. That was really fascinating for me as well because I love to, to learn how things happen. How do they work? It always fascinates me. How does this wine end up getting to Oregon from this place and this place and this place and this place? Um, but getting to walk through the vineyards, that was when it really struck me that you never really understand a wine until you've been in the vineyard. So what did you, I'm, I'm actually curious about the point you made, what did you find about the mechanics of how a wine gets into Oregon? Ah, well, um, so I watched that and then I helped make that happen in multiple ways too. So uh, both as a buyer, we did some private label things as well, working with suppliers all over and then Later in my career, when I worked for an importer, I helped distributors put together containers to bring wines from South America and from um, Europe as well. So I learned it's really complicated. <laughs> so I've gathered, I, I'm curious about it from your perspective, when you're doing, doing that kind of work, um, how do you build a, a portfolio like that? What are you sort of looking for and how do you make it happen? Um, I think to make it successful, the most important thing is to know that there are customers for it, right? Um, but also finding a balance of products to suit your customers, right? It can't be all one thing or just another. And then the logistics, it's really interesting of it, you know, we want the lowest price per bottle, so we've got to fill this container. Um, getting it from wineries to consolidation points, consolidation points into the container, a container onto ships, ships to, well, it used to be into port, but onto a train or onto a truck. There's so many different steps. <laughs> it's so much. So as you're progressing through these, through these different places, what was kind of drawing you to the next step? You mentioned obviously starting in grocery and then in corporate buying and importing. What, was sort of, what were sort of your, the, the motivations for taking the next step? Well, I went from Sue Pants to being New Seasons corporate buyer because I wanted a challenge and I always wanted more. And maybe I have a control issue, I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, no, I, I wanted a chance to make a program that I thought could be really successful. Uh, and then I did that for 13 years and I absolutely loved it. And I didn't have to leave, but I was always curious what it was like to work for a supplier. Um, in part, going back to those first years as a wine steward when I heard all these amazing stories of getting to know these wineries and getting to be there. Um, so that appealed to me. And it appealed to me just to have new challenges. And also, our company was at a, a growing pains point and I was frustrated. So, you know, the honest truth. 
Like, I was a little frustrated with how things were and thought that, yeah, I, I'm kind of done with things the way they are. So at what point did Linfield re-enter the picture? So from working for Weinbow on the importer side, uh, which I loved, so the long answer is that after about two years of that, Jeff Peterson called me and asked, to give, asked if I would help give a presentation, a lecture to one of his classes about distribution, wine distribution. I said, no problem. I put together the lecture. And the night before, I got an emergency email that there was an all hands required um, call happening the next morning, right at the time I was supposed to start that lecture. And our company was restructuring. <laughs> so that was my first experience. Fortunately, Jeff let me set it out. So we went through a restructure. And it was fine. But you know, everything changed. And it was fine. And then I got another phone call from Weinbow saying, so Tony, we want to open a distributor in Oregon. And I said, no, you don't. So we don't want to keep working with three different distributors. We don't want to open a new distributor from scratch. And they said, we're doing this. And that sort of thinly veiled, like, do you know anybody who might be around to manage it? Meaning, hey, Tony, we really want you to manage this for us. And so I agreed to help start a wine distributor, Greenfield, in Oregon as the only person on the ground in Oregon. But you know, I had a whole full huge corporate structure, Winebo being, at the time, the 10th largest wine company in the United States. Um, so, you know, attorney on the phone, call the OLCC, you know, <laughs> compliance person on the phone, do this, you know, operations guy talking about this, go check the building for that. Um, hiring and recruiting a staff and then trying to figure out how I get these people from all over to become a team and put their hearts and soul into building something new and then go out and convince customers that, yeah, you got to change who you buy this from again and please buy it all from us. And I did that for two years and it was hard. And like I told them, Oregon customers are really tough on outsiders, even though they know and love the products and trying to convince suppliers to come over when we didn't have the infrastructure to support such a big and geographically diverse state that the formula that works in small, close to each other, New England states does not work in the West. You know, chicken or the egg. You know, we need more money and more salespeople to get more brands, or I need more brands to get more money and salespeople, and it wasn't working. And so I saw, literally saw an ad in an online forum that Linfield was looking for a full-time educator. And I said, oh my gosh, wait a minute, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I have been teaching WSET classes for a few years at that point. I've been doing consumer classes in various places. Was always hoping from day one that wine, I could convince Winebow to let me be their West Coast educator since they had educators based on the East Coast, I was like, well, I should be your West Coast person. And they were like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Just run to Oregon, just stay in Oregon. Uh, just sell some wine. Yeah, yeah, well, how's that distributor coming along? <laughs> and I said, wow. So I picked up the phone. And what did you sort of find Linfield was looking for? They were looking for somebody who could do a lot of different things. I, so it wasn't just one thing, but to be able to teach that liberal arts level of a portfolio. And I was like, oh, that's me. Right? I don't have the super in-depth science of viticulture or winemaking, but I know how the business works. And I can tell you why Rioja tastes like Rioja. And I can tell you why um, Willamette Valley tastes like Willamette Valley and how all of those factors come into play. So tell me about getting here and sort of first impressions of what you would be doing and, and how you'd be doing it. I was drinking from the fire hose a bit, but uh, Greg Jones, 
helping my department chair, my supervisor was amazing. And I started in January 2020. <laughs> and so what we thought was going to happen it was all different by March. So how did, how did you adapt and how did the first year go? Uh, it went well. It went well. I think I adapted better than some people because I had been working for six years as the only employee of my company in the state of Oregon. So working from my house and spending a lot of time on things like Zoom were natural to me. I had already made that adjustment. That was fine. I knew how to make all of that work. Figuring out how to talk to 19-year-olds about wine, that was different. <laughs> that was different. So how did your sort of, how did, you, how did you make your role evolve, I guess, or how did you, as you were adjusting to that, what did you find was successful? What did you find was, what did you feel was most important to impart? Oh, I figured out pretty quickly that what I thought was um, active learning wasn't active learning, and that I needed to learn some teaching skills that were different. Because going from eager consumers who had a lot of experience and were maybe just as excited to tell me what they knew about wine, to um, in some cases in 101, having in geography of wine, having you know, at least 10 students who are only there because they were getting a much needed LC credit. It was a whole different experience. <laughs> what did you find students responded to the most? Or what have you found students respond to the most? Oh, well, they really respond well when there's a glass in front of them and they get to taste it for themselves. <laughs> but don't we all? <laughs> But not, not I didn't, and I didn't mean that being about the alcohol, but the chance to actually, like, this is what I'm talking about, right? Like, see it for yourself, taste it for yourself. And as, obviously, you've been, through, been here through some changes in Linfield's wine, and of course, through some struggles in higher education in general during a pandemic. So, uh, coming out the other side of that, uh, how have things changed for you, and how are you, how do you sort of feel in the role here? Things have definitely changed. I mean, our department has fallen apart and come back together again, but it's good. I, I see myself staying here so much that I am looking at how I'm gonna end up, how I'm gonna get a master's degree so that I can advance and stay and grow and be a part, a bigger part of Linfield. And tell me about what you th sort of think about Linfield's approach to wine education and how it's going so far. I think our liberal arts approach is really smart because it's not the best program if you want to be a winemaker, it's not the best program if you're going to manage vineyards, but if you want to be in the business, most of the jobs are in the business. I think back to those amazing sales reps who taught me so much about wine, our students are coming out with more knowledge than they have, even after years in the business, about how things work and these great skills that set them up, not just to be that, but to be the managers and to be the directors and to be the GMs of future companies who are driving that business. And they can have all of those amazing experiences to travel around the world like I did, see wine on however many continents it's been. Let's see, one, two, three, four, four continents now. <laughs> and just a few more to check off. Yeah. I have yet to see any wine in Asia. It's, it's on the to-do list. And then maybe Antarctica after that would be a... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> as you mentioned, uh, kind of department coming back together, as you look ahead for Linfield Wine and for your role in it, what are you seeing in the future and kind of what are you excited to bring to the table or in, um, grow in the program? Um, see more of, well, where I see myself is just in the classroom a lot. I really want to be that part of it, helping people make connections and watching those light bulbs go off. That's my favorite part. Uh, I would like us to do more consumer and more adult learning opportunities 
and I'm really curious about how we can use digital technology, how we can use various opportunities that way to grow that. Um, I'm curious about the possibility of VR in wine education. Like, if I can't take all of my students, you know, to Mendoza and to Barolo and to Sicily, can I bring them there virtually? Could we make that happen? Could we, you know, get, ha go into the lab and all walk through a vineyard together and talk about what terroir is and talk about the aspect that way? Is that possible? It's amazing to think about. Right? Yeah. So obviously you've been, um in and around the Oregon wine industry for, for a while and, and not always focused entirely on it, but obviously aware of it. So I'm curious, you talked a little about your first impressions earlier. Um, how have you seen the industry grow and change in the years you've been around it? And what does the industry look like to you in, in 2023? Well, growth, wow. Yeah, so much growth. Um, it, it's interesting to watch how Willamette Valley has become internationally renowned for the quality of wine and how we do that with such a small sliver of the US's production and yet it's a legitimate category that's on lists and on shelves all over the world. One of my favorite things is seeing new generations taking over and to know like Alex and Allison Sokolbosser, who I've known for, oh my goodness, more than 30 years and watching them take over and run the family business and grow and um, you know, instill their ideas and their values and their curiosity in the businesses and to see new people come in um, like the folks at Cho, right? And bring new faces and new ideas and new perspectives to line that we really need. And yet, you know, it, that coexists so well with the traditional of, you know, the Lats and the Sokolbossers and the Ponzi's. Like everyone, I get a little worried when outside investment comes in but I also know as a business person how much we need that, how much we need those dollars and those systems that they bring because all boats rise with the tide. And if they can make the path and they can spend the dollars to keep Willamette Valley Pinot Noir on wine lists around the world, as opposed to it being a race to the bottom and, oh gosh, go out there and try and find an Australian Shiraz on a list these days. It's really, really hard. So how do we keep that growing? And I'm not saying there's not good Australian Shiraz. I love the stuff. There's great producers, but, you know, Yellowtail created this race to the bottom. You brought up an interesting point when you mentioned kind of the, the traditions of the, the Lets and the Sokolblossers and, and new folks like the Cho's coming in. So. From your perspective, is there a, what's the connecting? What's the, what is sort of the Oregon wine industry ethos? Or what is it that makes that all work together in your brain, in your mind? We've mostly remained open and collaborative and supportive. And it's not just other producers, but also consumers. Um, also the industry wanting to support local. I mean, buy local was, a phrase you hear in Oregon before, I really believe in other states, right? That was a thing here before it caught on elsewhere. And that sort of support allows experimentation. It allows for, you know, that whatever it is, 872nd winery to open that also makes Pinot Noir. And there's still a space for that. What do you see next for the industry? Hmm. Well, I do think about climate change. I do think about the fact that we have a narrow window where Pinot Noir is happy. And we're good for a while. But what happens in 30 years, what happens in 50, 
What happens when consumers are like, all right, I'm bored of Pinot and I want something new? They did it with Merlot, so they did it with Shiraz. So <laughs> may it just happen with, with Pinot Noir. So what do we turn to next? How do we diversify what we do? Because I think it's 72% of the valley is planted to Pinot Noir. What else can we do? And we certainly see amazing uh, growth with Chardonnay. Uh, quality changes since we figured out the whole Dijon clone, but also showing consumers that there are different styles of Chardonnay. And, you know, it's like you, keep, you don't have to hate all Chardonnay for whatever reason. So what else is there? What else can we do? What other interesting grapes would work well in our climate now or in our climate in 50 years? And you obviously have a kind of a unique perspective because you're, you are sort of nurturing students out into this industry with the hope that you have students who find places that, so tell me what you kind of hope the industry is that they're entering into and what you'd like to sort of see them be able to accomplish. I hope that the industry is just as welcoming for them as it was for me, because I was 24. Well, I mean, I started at 22 in a tasting room, uh, but got into it full time at 24. And there were some people who questioned a 24-year-old woman, um, but I hope that there are more opportunities, and I hope that they don't encounter barriers I hope that they have opportunity to try new things still. I hope that it hasn't become so, nope, this is how we do it. What about for yourself and your own future? Obviously you mentioned wanting to be here and kind of pursuing further education for yourself. Uh, what else are you looking ahead to, either on a, on a wine uh, level or on a personal level? Well, like I said, I'm looking at master's degree programs, so getting myself in that. and. I just said I, I want to learn about digital marketing, and I think I've just put myself on the hook to do this for real now. <laughs> but I see that's the place that uh, definitely our local industry, but maybe wine and whole, needs a push. We're a little afraid of new technology in this industry, and so what does it look like? And I think a lot about how Gen Z, even millennials, aren't adopting wine. They say at the same rate of boomers. And I, I have this curiosity with how we make that happen and why it's not happening. And I think that a big part of it also pushes against those parts of my beliefs about tradition and doing these same old things. And I think wine needs to find a way to have these two different things that coexist, mm -hmm. of that same old, cool, you know, terroir-driven, um, you know, very limited and special and precious and exclusive, right? Like, excluding being a part of that with like wine in Kansas fun, wine that is not so special or fancy or exclusive can bring more people in. What if we made wine easier to drink? And that includes a lot of things that people in the industry want to turn their nose up at. It means things like residual sugar. It means things like Snoop Dogg's face on wine labels. It means bulletin boards that have Chardonnay paired with tortilla chips, which I know at one Oregon Wine Symposium caused quite a tizzy years and years ago. And I said, I think it's fantastic. Because like, why, why does it have to be a steak and mushrooms, right? Why can't it be tortilla chips? Well, champagne and popcorn, right? So how do we make it less precious? How do we make it less special? How can we make it something that is less expensive, which again, pushes back on a lot of the things that the industry doesn't like. But I worked in grocery retail for years, and whether that created my vision or my vision created that of wine shouldn't have to be exclusive and fancy and special, but it can be Tuesday night, and it can be, I only have this $10 bill, and I have to get dinner too, right? 
Like, how do we make that possible for people? Otherwise, it's just going to be a bunch of old dead white people, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, all right. That's all the questions that I have for you. Anything that I didn't ask that I should have? Anything that we didn't cover today that you'd like to cover? No, I think that's good. Did we cover it all? Excellent. All right. Thank you so much, Tony, for Thanks. your time, for sharing yeah. your story with us and uh, answering all of our questions. And we'll go ahead and let you off the hook. All right. Thank Thanks you. so much.